Hello listeners, today is Wednesday, January 17th. Welcome to the Behind the Numbers Reimagining Retail Show, an e-marketer podcast. This is the show where we talk about how retail collides with every part of your lives. You're probably very disappointed to not be hearing Sarah's voice. I am Marcus Johnson, guest host, filling in for Sarah Lebo, who's traveling slowly but surely, kind of. So hello, Sarah. Today's episode is about the takeaways from NRF 2024. And I'm joined today by one singular guest. That's all we need. Right, Susie? Absolutely. <laughs> VP of content, head of our retail desk, just back from NRF. It's Susie David Canyon. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited about today's episode. I, I say just back from NRF. She she took a train. Okay, so I it's mean, not that. She can get on like a subway. galactic ship or anything. Yeah, she got, took a subway. In the snow to make it here on time to have That's this true. conversation with you guys in the lengthiest way possible. <laughs> <laughs> I told Susie this is supposed to be a short episode. She told me quite flatly, no, I'll be speaking for as long as I want. Correct. Because so we'll see you know how what it goes. is happening right now? We just missed it a little bit. Is mm. Drew Barrymore is on stage and I missed it so that we can hang out. Well, that's what another reason to make it sh- shorter. Well, no, I had to it? come home. Oh, to you missed Drew Barrymore yeah. to be here is what you're trying yeah. to <laughs> Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Let's see what she does for <laughs> you're you. Welcome. This, this, the Please sacrifices. Let that, let that translate on into a weekly listen <laughs> win. Please. It won't. Uh, hey. We start, of course, with our first segment for this show, which is free sample. This is our Did You Know segment where we share a fun fact, tidbit or question. I say we, it's me. Uh, Sarah has sent me over this one. So over the last, this is a question, Susie. Okay. So buckle up. Okay. Over the last five years, how much money has Starbucks gained from unspent gift card and app balances? How much, this is multiple choice. Okay. How much money has Starbucks gained from unspent gift card and app balances? A, $100 million, B, 300, C, 600, or D, $900 million. 100, 300, 600, or $900 million. 600, uh, worldwide, $600 million. Yes, but no, that's not the right answer. Oh, the coffee chain has claimed 900 million. You were towards the top end, 900 yeah. million in unspent money, uh, according to the Washington Consumer Protection Coalition, which has filed a complaint asking Washington's attorney general to investigate the company. So the context, Susie, the complaint saying uh, that Starbucks has violated this act, the Washington Consumer Protection Act, by tricking customers into loading more money than they otherwise would onto gift cards and the rewards app, making it difficult for consumers to fully spend their balances. So it's using dark patterns to trick folks. What do you make of this? I am not surprised that this is happening. If you just think about your own behavior, you know, sometimes we forget. Sometimes mm-hmm. we don't realize it's not that there's a hundred dollars left on people's cards. It's that like two dollars here or three dollars there. It all and adds it's adding up, up, right? Exactly right. What I think is a shame is that is sort of a liability for the retailer that they should be carrying throughout their lifetime, right? And Starbucks is still in business. It's different when it's like a Toys R Us that went out of business and had the gift cards and they're gone. Like that's understandable. But from a consumer protection perspective, there must be some sort of, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a Starbucks drinker, so I don't know, but maybe those gift cards have an expiry date and that's why Starbucks gets to hang on to so much money. Mm, that's a great point. I'm not sure either. I do know that I have been part of a rewards program that they changed. It was an airline. It changed its rewards program and made it harder to spend the points that I'd accumulated. And so now I can't spend the points fast enough based on how much I'm spending on my credit card that probably tells me about my credit card spending habits. But the fact that they changed it, I think was disingenuous is the right word, but it felt kind of underhanded and, and unexpected. And as a consumer, made me want to, you know, maybe explore other options. So you have to be careful because if the consumer doesn't, you know, think that there's a certain amount of value that they're still getting, maybe they don't sign up in the first place, but maybe current loyalty members pull back. 
Totally. And that you're talking about loyalty points, right? So that's also a completely different thing. That's like a liability, like the fake money yes. that you get rewarded, but it's not fake. It's like not really money you've spent, but you've quote unquote earned it because you've spent mm-hmm. a threshold. So that too, I'm sure there's a lot that goes on claim. I just let yeah. one go. It was $10. I was like, I'm not going to spend a hundred dollars to get $10. Like that just doesn't make sense. This yeah. stat is even more frightening, right? Because it's people who've bought, like if I bought my niece a Starbucks gift card, and mm-hmm. she lost it or forgets about it or whatever it is, or there's $3 left and she doesn't think about getting the bottle of water. That's the money that they're accumulating. So that's someone else's money that they're accumulating. Yes. That's adding to yeah. their bottom line. Like that's nuts. Right. Real money. And then, yeah, my example, earned money in rewards that's left on the table. And uh, this is close to a billion dollars. This is not pocket that's a change. Lot. So it's a yeah. significant amount. You know what I will tell you though? Sorry. I don't know if this works. Started already. Yeah, I go know. On. Sorry. <laughs> Can't help myself. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but if it's not, someone should be doing this. We should be able to put all of our gift cards into digital wallets so we don't lose them. That way we have a better chance of using the $3 here, the $4 there. And that could be some, a way f- to help the consumer. Definitely not the retailer. The retailer wants you to shirk and not, I don't, it's not called yeah. shirk. There's a special name for people who don't use their gift cards. But it, Do you mean like mobile check deposit style? Like take a picture of the gift card and it loads maybe it Maybe or like put the numbers in. You know how if you're using the gift card digitally, there are numbers yes. on the back with like a little mm-hmm. pin. There must mm-hmm. be a way. Like I just got the Omni card for the New York subway that there's a way to put that into your digital wallet. Like there must be a way, but this is probably why the consumer protection board is getting involved because they're, it, I'm not calling them shady because they're not doing anything shady, but it's sad, right? That we're leaving so much money on the table and we just yeah. need to remove the friction point so that we don't leave money on well, the table. It's also interesting that there's nearly a billion dollars left on the table, but I wonder how much they would have made if they'd encouraged people or reminded people, That's sent right. them notifications saying, hey, you still have money to spend. I've only got $2 left. I can come in, use the $2, spend three you know, on the coffee. And I wonder how much they would have made had they encouraged people to use those dollars on gift cards as opposed to, yeah, holding on to them. Uh, Anyway, that's all we've got time for, for free sample. We move now to our next segment, National Retail Federation, me this, National Retail Federation, (laughs) me that. We discuss an interesting retail topic. Sarah is never going to let me host again. Retell me this, retell me that is what it's normally called. Today's topic is NRF 2024. Just the one segment today. So, Susie, you were just at the New York-based NRF conference the past few days where tens of thousands of folks gather to talk about the upcoming year in retail. Let's talk about a key takeaway from a session Uh, You probably went to a bunch, you're probably part of a bunch, but was there one key takeaway, one or two from a particular session or two? I'm so glad you threw in the two because I might have three. Two, I could, oh, jeez, <laughs> three? No, no, but two really little ones, little, okay. little ones that we don't even need to have a conversation around. And then one that I would love to talk more about. Um, so the first okay. one, which I was like, versus. oh yeah, this too. There is in the snacking business and there was a big CPG snack branch with a supermarket sort of ish type company. So they were together on stage and, you know, they think about snacking slightly differently because one has the end consumer versus the other one who's trying to reach the end consumer. And there is a tension I never really thought about in snacking, which is like people want to be healthy, but they also want to be indulgent. And so as the manufacturer, you have to think about your breadth of snacks in that sort of like performance, fun, healthy, just healthy, and then like super indulgent, like as a, I'm taking a Kit Kat break, indulgent. Yeah. Yeah. Snacks does have a negative connotation, you could argue, right? And trying to rebrand the title of or the category of snacks, because it's basically just having something in between meals that doesn't have to be, you know, things that are traditionally been deemed or seen as unhealthy. Right. And so Mm -hmm. for me, that tension was one I had not really thought about. And so I just wanted to highlight that because there's tension everywhere we go and everything we do, and it's important to keep track of it. The other topic that is really, really important that I believe in strongly, which is sustainability. And there was another Mm. CPG company, Pepsi, who was talking about all the different programs that they do 
across the entire ecosystem. And one of the things that we don't talk enough about, which I think is really important, and we talk about it on the apparel side, but we don't talk about it in the food area as much, is that water is important, right? And as we have more and more drought and other weather climate issues, farmers are going to have a tough time. And a lot of snacks come from what farmers make, corn, potatoes, garlic. And I think it's really important as a retailer to think about sustainability with your partners, even if it's not visible to the consumer, because everybody needs to work on this together and it has to be a joint commitment. And Pepsi was talking about how they're working with Walmart so that it's truly a much bigger than one company sort of commitment. Mm. And I think that that was for me really important. So this was the partnerships angle. This was the, and no one player can go at it alone. And so right. Pepsi and Walmart are working together. I like that. For me, I think we always think about sustainability. We think about packaging. You know, we think about the lights, the EV, the gasoline, the carbon footprint. And we don't often talk about water. And yeah. water is critical. And we talk about water when it comes to jeans and how much water they need to make jeans. Right. And it was maybe a fun fact of mine in one of the dinner party data situations. Like, Fun's generous. Yes. <laughs> but I didn't really think about how the trickle down effect for snacking and sustainability and climate goes mm -hmm. all the way down to our farmers in the US who need help. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. The partnership thing is really interesting because you see coalitions of folks working together on so many other issues and there's so many different bodies set up to work together on different issues around the world and you know when it comes to sustainability and companies it does seem like they are all trying to go it alone and so i think that's a really interesting angle are you ready for my real one now are they were the two small ones yeah, those are the two small ones <laughs> ready okay i was about to move on to the next question no yeah, go on. so i thought the moe hennessy person who spoke on stage was mm -hmm. brilliant he was not only captivating and passionate but he made me think about alcohol in a different way and How so? i that well that's the thing right so like he came from a luxury background he has a bunch mm -hmm. of luxury brands so he talked through inflation and how for them now that's their new context and that inflation for them happens at many different the cost of making goods for them the inflation increases are across their entire value chain, if you think about it, in terms of glass costs more money, transportation costs more money, wages cost more money, like everything costs more money. And so like they work very hard to figure out price elasticity to see what is the right price that helps them with their margin and it absorbs as much of the increases as possible without it being too hard for the customer. So already mm -hmm. the fact that we were talking about price elasticity was really exciting. But what I thought was even more cool is that if you think about liquor, it's sold in a store and all the bottles are one next to the other and there's zero differentiation and it's all like, you know, price point driven. And so they really rely heavily on brands. And then because it's a product, here's another tension. It's a product that has a lot of history and that has a formula that is there for a reason. And that's what people expect. They can't play around with that. So as they think about brand awareness and getting people on board for them, and standing apart for them, partnerships are really important. We're back. Yep. Mm -hmm. But this time it's like partnership with stars you recognize right. and pop culture right. and icons and figuring out how do you bridge the gap between this like heritage that you have mm -hmm. and this modern sort of cultural, everybody knows who you are. So they come to you. And then he showed us some very cool videos of which there was this whole brand experience in London. I don't know if you've been at Harrods where it was like a champagne cafe of sorts, but you could also buy bottles, which got a, our team, my team, thinking through like, would you ever walk to or go drive to a luxury boutique that only sold one brand of liquor? Mm, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think we all had the same like, well, I guess yeah. it depends on the brand. And, yeah. and Sky was saying, well, if there's education around it, like if there's a tasting or if there's some sort yeah. of activity around it, I'm An more experience. likely to go. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Very nice. Very nice indeed. All right, let's move on to the next question. You, you're walking around, you have to attend some panels, be on some panels, and you're speaking to people and they're like, oh my God, is that you from that show? Oh my God, I recognize you. What's the most interesting side conversation that you had, apart from, you know, beating away the fans? I mean, there were a lot. So I only it's have two. Are you ready? Fans? 
two fans? No, I have a multitude. Oh, you're talking about takes. Yeah, I only have two things that I thought (laughs) we could talk about. Um, One is there are a lot of vendors who are suppliers or partners who talk a lot about how their solution will also help with fraud. And I think, you know, we're hearing a lot about that in the news right now in terms of understanding that margins and retailers are saying that they're not doing quite as well at the bottom line because of stealing and shrinkage and all these other things. Mm -hmm. So it was very cool to see all these different types of vendors that in addition to the other things they do, they're trying to help solve for fraud. And when I talked to one of the folks, I was like, well, can you tell me more about, because he was talking about fraud in the terms of credit cards. So that was new for me. So I was like, can you tell me more about that? And he was like, yeah, if you buy from one credit card and you return onto another credit card, that could be fraudulent. And I was like, oh, I never really thought about that. And then in the end, we decided that bad behavior is bad behavior. And if you're going to do bad behavior, you're going to figure out a way to get around all the systems. But I'm throwing in, it's important to have a really good vendor partner who can help you identify the signals of bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Very nice. That's one. And the other one, I may or may not have been on a panel today, and we were talking a little bit about the economy. And one of the things that my panelists talked about, which I hadn't you know, we talk a lot and we were asked a lot about the economic indicators around what am I looking for to see if it's going to be a good year or a bad year. And everyone talks about consumer confidence, but I think if you've been listening to the show enough, you know that we don't necessarily believe on the whole that consumer confidence is the right measure. It's lagging what people say they're going to do versus what they're going to do. And if you need something yep. versus if you want something, it's not There's necessarily the best. Yeah, there's definitely mm-hmm. a disconnect. So one of the conversations we were having on the side was with the panelists on the for the media around consumer behaviors and what we're expecting for 24 was with, well, I was on the panel actually with our friend, Jonathan Silver and Mark Matthews, and we were talking about the different economic indicators. And one of the things that I always look for and think about more broadly is wage growth. And is that growing faster than inflation and savings rate? And the thing I hadn't thought about that Mark pointed out, which was really interesting for me, was savings rate is great, but you should think about it in terms of dollars, like how many dollars are people saving? But also really critical is the delinquency rate, right? Because you all know that I don't believe in buy now, pay later. I think we're just setting up people for disaster. Mm -hmm. But right now, the numbers indicate that as people are borrowing, they're also returning the money quickly enough. And so the delinquency rates are not super high yet. And that's what he keeps track of. So one of the things we were saying is it's really important to think about high level, but then there are lots of other underlying metrics that you really need to get to the bottom of to have a really good picture of how the economy is doing. Very nice. True story. What is one interesting booth that you saw? Okay. Are you ready? I only have one. There were very, there were so many, but what really, really, really caught my eye was that JP Morgan was there. Whoa. Yes. And I'm not going to do them justice. The minute I told them that I was going to be on a podcast and that I would like to talk about why they're here, the PR person came right away and I was like, it's really, it's really very informal. You know, I don't want to quote anything. I just want to talk about what you guys are doing. Uh, and she was like, okay, fine. So. <laughs> Ready for this? They are. Let me sit down. Yes, please sit down again. So they are doing facial recognition at point of sale. So instead of using your credit card or your Apple watch to tap, right? Can you imagine? Then he asked me if I wanted to test it and I said, no, thank you. (laughs) So so I told the, I told the PR girl who was lovely, there's a small chance that I have to say that there are some barriers to entry on this. Adoption questionable. Yeah. Right. But I also don't have an Apple phone. And from what I understand, those who do have an Apple phone already use facial recognition to get well, into Well, they use phone. it on their phone that they yeah. trust their phone because they carry it around with them all the time. If, if it was a, is this point of sale like? Yeah, at the store. Like a store would recognize your face yeah. and be like, oh, this Susie paid. At the, so or as always, Marcus, too, he's broke. Get, he has no money for this purchase. I tried to get to the bottom of this. So it is not like the Amazon scan and go type technology where you put your right. palm, you go into the store, you take the things Just off the out, shelf and you walk out. Yes, yep. thank you. It is the like truly a digital wallet enabler. And instead of it being your palm or wow. your finger, it's your face. So they feel like it's very secure that your face is much more secure. And it is, you know, at the point of sale, literally at the point of sale, instead of tapping your card, you can yep. show your face. So they are going to start or have started partnering with retailers because that changes sort of some of the prompts 
on the pad so that that could be a component of it, which is also, he was mentioning, a great place for them to advertise. So I thought that was kind of a cool tie in to retail media. Oh, nice. Yeah, that is good. Okay, so it'd probably be like, all right, would you like to pay with cash, card, your face? Correct. And you would select the option, got yes. it, got it. Okay. So I got to see it. He demoed it. It looks very cool. It's just, I think the small, now I only asked three people of which you're one of them. So we're two who would not do it if I interpreted your reaction correctly. And one person was like, yeah, I think I would do it. It makes sense. I'm already doing it in other I- places. It sounds terrifying, but yeah, I think pro- people are obsessed with convenience and what's more convenient than pressing the button that says accept and they, it's like e-passport gates. Yes, you put your passport in, it, yeah, you walk in, it scans your face and then you walk out. You don't have to go in long lines, you don't have to yeah. speak to people. It's yeah. quicker. And That's so it. I can see people being apprehensive and then immediately doing it because it's quicker. So last question, Susie, what is one thing you heard that you disagreed with at the event? So there was a duo on stage with their interviewer and one of them, something that made my, I don't know what the right expression to use is, which was value always wins. And I was like, what did he just say? That is absolutely not true. It is not just about the price point. But then his co friend on stage was like trying to re-engineer that statement so that it was a little bit more accurate. So he <laughs> really tried his hardest, but the other person was like really <laughs> gung-ho about, no, nope, it's all about price. And so I, I do not agree with that. Like his co-presenting friend, I agree that value <laughs> means different things to different people of which price is one of them, but value could mean also good quality for the price. It could mean gigant, you know, make my life easier, help me save mm-hmm. time. It means mm-hmm. so many different things. And I really understanding who the consumer that you're trying to target, how they define value is critical. What's a co-friend? We don't have time for that. But Susie, thank you so much for hanging out with us for this episode and telling us all about what happened at this year's NRF. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. Sarah will be back next week with another episode of Reimagining Retail and eMarketer podcast, or Sarah lives at the airport now. I hope to see you tomorrow, though, for the Behind the Numbers Daily and eMarketer podcast, where we'll be talking all about health trends in 2024.